People just love to collect stuff. And let me tell you something about serious collectors. Serious collectors don't like junk. Serious collectors aren't going to sell you a hundred dollar item for ten bucks. Serious collectors don't pawn their treasures. Serious collectors exist everywhere. Collecting Seriously, a show dedicated to real collecting. Without the buying, selling, or haggling. Educational, interesting, and entertaining. Seriously. Previously on Collecting Seriously. And I used to help an old friend of mine cart crates like these packed with records to local record shows. We're going to go see what my old friend Doug Smith is up to now. Good to see you, Jim. Thanks for inviting yourself over. About nine or ten years ago, I started collecting high school yearbooks. I have a music library, is how I would describe my personal collection. I've still got my Matchbox cars, celebrity autographs like Chuck Berry, ephemera, which is early billheads, papers, and letters. I also collect vintage sports equipment, early postcards from my hometown, antique photographic images, anything from the good old days. Hey, Doug. You want to be a regular part of the show? I guess. Cool. Later. My name is Jimmy Sparks. I wanted to create a show that showcases collections and collectors. Expert mega collector Doug Smith and I have no trouble finding incredible collections in every category you can think of and in any neighborhood in any city. No selling, no buying, no haggling. We're not interested and they're not either. We are all about the stuff. It's collecting. Seriously. You know, Doug, coming over last week was a lot of fun. It was interesting, and your collections are very cool. But really, I got overwhelmed. There were so many things, I really wasn't quite sure where to start and what to ask. Well, I guess I'm a bit unusual in that regard, and it's very hard to become an expert in so many different fields, which is why I think we should try to concentrate on collectors that are more focused in a specific interest or genre. You know, why is it that everybody has a large collection of everything? It's like they got to get everything of one item. You know, that's true. And when people start collecting, that's um, maybe one of their focuses. I want to have the biggest collection in the world of mm -hmm. whatever. And eventually they realize that the value is not in bulk. You know, I know sometimes when you look at a collector's collection, they have something that they want to just take you to. They want to take you into something and say, why would somebody make this? You gotta see this. Isn't this the dumbest thing you ever saw? And it's usually a misprint or it's something that is just so strange that I would call that kind of a fun object or a funny object. But the value of a collection is really in the unique pieces. The one-of-a-kinds, the historically significant, the pieces that everybody wants. The chase pieces, maybe? Right, the pieces that are worth the most money. You know, unique things are great and they really make a collection, but even one of those pieces might be what I would call an ace in the hole. It could be the thing that's worth the most in the collection. It could be the, the item that they started the collection with. Maybe they just love it. It's really defined by the collector. You know, maybe it's even a piece that they don't have yet. So a collection is basically made up of bulk, fun pieces, the unique items, and the ace in the hole. So basically that spells Bafua? Bafua. Bafua. I don't quite understand it, but it makes a lot of sense to me. You want a soft drink? Sure. Oh, uh, here. Me, I'll probably have one of these. Yeah, I think I'm on one. Speaking of the foamy stuff, I know a collector that's really into Bruriana. You've got to see his collection. This is where Merle lives. Now, I actually went to school with his son. We used to play basketball together. He's a real wiry kid, a real scrapper. Always had his hands in there, poking at the ball. We called him Spider. Anyway, now, I'm good friends with his dad. Come on down, Doug. I'm gonna show you what, I, what I've been messing around with for the last 40 years. This is part of my uh, collection, and I collect Buriana stuff from Davenport, which is, dates back to about the 1850s. And uh, then I've got a lot of tobacco stuff. Davenport was one of the biggest uh, cigar uh, manufacturing places in the, in the country at one time. 
So this is basically what you see here is going to be about 99.9% .9 Davenport. And, uh, it's unbelievable. I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> I don't know what to grab first. <laughs> well, actually, I started this about 40 years ago with my son. He was collecting beer cans, and I kind of got into the beer cans a little bit, but I decided that the beer cans were not for me. I wanted the other things that were related to the beer industry, so I started collecting signs and openers and calling cards. Uh, I've got uh, pictures. This is part of the, the uh, can collection here. These cans up here are all Davenport, and from there to there are Davenport, and these two here are Davenport, but the rest of them are kind of his collection, and he really doesn't have a place to keep them, so he keeps them in my basement. So tell me, Merle, when did you first realize that your drinking problem had become a constructive hobby? Well, that was about, uh, about 40 years ago I actually started this, but I actually haven't drank for 38 years, Doug, so... You don't drink, you don't smoke, so, so what got you interested in tobacco and brewery items? Well, I, I've been kind of a collector for years of different things, and I found out that I first started collecting, I collected everything that was beer. And then I said, you know what, this is crazy. I don't have a big enough house or building to put this stuff in. So then I started narrowing it down and, and I, I started thinking, well, why not just collect local stuff from Davenport? You know, Merle, I'm, I'm a big Davenport collector myself, so this stuff really, uh, it's amazing. I, I've never seen uh, the entire collection of Davenport cans. I think you have every one that was ever made, don't you? All except one. There's one that's a, uh, it's kind of a uh, glossy color like this one here, Doug. Uh -huh. And this is the pale color of it. And there's only one of those known, and it's out in, uh, in, a, in a collection in Pennsylvania. So we, uh, we really don't have access to that. We'd like to, but uh, so would a lot of other collectors, though. And after Prohibition, 1935, they, they opened a brewery in Davenport called Zollers. They operated from, uh, from 35 to 45, and then Zollers was bought out by a, a company called Blackhawk Brewing Company, and they were in business from 45 to 52. And in 52, Uckdorf bought them out, and then Uckdorf from 52 to 56 brewed until December of 56, and then they actually closed the doors, so the breweries were no longer in Davenport. So the Uckdorf can was the, the last can that was made here? The Uckdorf can was the last can made here, and it was, uh, it's, uh, like I say, about 1956 is when they actually closed the doors. The big breweries came in and just kind of really uh, stepped up their uh, production, and uh, they, they couldn't compete with them, you know. Over in here, we got the uh, we got them as early as the Independent Brewing and Malting Company, which are, of course, pre-pro. Those are pre-pro labels. And another interesting one we have is the Brewer's Best. Uh, that was a, a national outfit that actually went to small breweries and asked them to do the brewing. They were going to become the biggest brewer in the United States because they have all these little companies, maybe 15 or 16 different companies, took that on but uh, it, it never flew. Oh, these are neat. What are, what are these boxes? Well, these are cigar boxes, Doug. This is my second passion. I, I collect Davenport cigar and tobacco items. I probably have about 125 different cigar boxes all from Davenport now. One of the neat ones that I have here I like is this, this one that was Bill Hickey's personal box that said on his his desk, and, oh, I, uh, and I have Hickey Brothers Hick, from uh, Hickey Brothers in, da in Davenport. Sure, you know Hickey's had about 185 stores across the Midwest. This particular box set on Bill Hickey's desk, it's got his name here, and then of course it's got his name on the outside of the box. So the only one I've seen, and I guess he probably didn't have one on every desk wherever he sat. You know, no, so. I would say that's a, a near one of a kind. And then this one is a, a, a Davenport uh, Harcourt Cigar Company from Davenport here. And they were real proud of their cigars, so they made a Davenport cigar. So it kind of has a nice logo on their boxes that show up the Davenport part of it all the time. I just love the covers of some of these. You know, Doug, along with those cigar boxes, I have a lot of other pieces that were cigar related. These three pieces are cigar trimmers. And the manufacturers would furnish these little uh, trimmers here. And what they do is you push down on that trimmer and you can see the blade comes out from the inside. Oh, sure. And cuts the cigar off. Well, these were three of the pretty prominent makers in Davenport, Peter Jacobson, Ferd Hawk, and uh, Nicholas Cunin. And it just so happens that I happen to have these three. Uh, there, Harkert also made one, but I don't have the Harkert one, but I, there is one available that's in, it, that a collector has in Davenport, but he hasn't parted with it and yet. Not, not so, so available then. <laughs> not so but available. But it does exist. Right. And this is a unique piece. This uh, uh, is a cigar lighter. You put the cigar in here, and you put your lighter fluid in here, and then you light this. It's like a little, it's almost like an oil lamp. Typical piece that you might find on a cigar counter in Davenport. It's called fill your lighter. And what they did was, when you bought your tobacco or your cigars there, when these were on the counter, they would give you free lighter fluid, and all you'd do is push the 
tube back like this, pump it, get lighter fluid, and then you'd close it again because if some smart alley kid came in, he'd pump that and he'd pump lighter fluid all over. But this was a little tube that recirculated back into the reservoir that held your lighter fluid, Doug. Now what era are we talking? This piece here, it's probably from the 20s, I'm thinking. In the 1909 city directory, I think there were 41 different cigar manufacturers in Davenport. Oh. That's a lot for a town of this size, you know. Right. These are all cigar box openers. We had all the different manufacturers handed them out to the people that sold the cigars. This was Harkert, this is Bame, this is a Ferd Hawk, this is a Raphael. That little hook you see, that was there's a nail on the top of every cigar box that, that they put in the nail to hold the box closed. And you could raise that nail up with that. And then when you put it back in, you got the little hammer like on the end and you pound the nail back in again so it wouldn't fall open. Man, this is just endless, Merle. It's amazing. Look at the table. What, now what's the historical significance of this table? Actually, the historical significance of this table is it came out of a tavern in Davenport that's still in existence. A friend of mine that owned the tavern some years ago, he actually had this picture and he gave it to me. Well, some years later, I came across this table and four of these chairs. These were called euchre tables. They played euchre. And most of them just took a piece of chalk and made an X there like they played 15 point euchre. And then as you uh, won the game, you'd take that X and kind of mark it out. Well, sometimes the tables got wet and the guy's elbow would mark out too many pieces so they thought maybe you were cheating, see? So then they took the beer mugs and they had them down here and they called this the schooner holder down here. This one is very unique in that it's round, it's made out of walnut. I can't believe the number of signs that you have. The, the lit signs are, I know that they're extremely rare. Yeah, they, they came along kind of one by one over the years. I never bought them in bulk any place, Doug. They just happened to, you know, where I was at a certain place, a collection or some collector would call me that's selling them. Zollers, by far, when they came back after Prohibition, had the most different signs. And then over here, of course, these are all the other Zoller signs, that the different ones that I, that I happen to have, so. Well, it's amazing that a sign of this age, a neon sign, would survive this many years. The main board was bought in, uh, at, at a show in St. Louis and uh, it came back to Davenport and, uh, and a good, very good friend of mine actually sold it to me. Uh, he said it, it belonged in my collection and it did not have the neon on it, but there's a neon place here in Davenport that just does a fabulous job. So the fellow free-handed every bit of that sign that you see to reinstate it to what it was. So the board, this board's all original, but the glass is all new on that sign. 99% of this stuff all was trash cans someplace along the line. It went to dumps. And you know, older people had this stuff and uh, uh, they, when they passed away, people would say, oh, let's throw the, nobody wants that beer stuff, we'll throw it away, you know, so it all went to the dump. So the more of it got thrown away, the more unique the other pieces became, so. Doug, you, you've seen a lot of things before. What do you think this might be? It's a little bit unusual. It looks like a bowling pin. <laughs> well, you're almost close. What you do is you pull this stopper back, you put a cork in here, then you push it down and you can cork either your beer or your liquor bottles or whatever you got. So it's a little bit different, isn't it? Are you ever willing to pay more for something than, than what it's really worth just to get it in well, the collection? Actually, Doug, you would say, well, what's it worth? Well, if you've never seen one before and you've never bought one before, what, what is worth? It's something that you kind of have to project in your mind, say, I'm willing to part with this much for that or what, but you can't find it in a book, you can't find it printed anywhere, so you'd have to either say, well, it sold one time for this or something, but most of the pieces I got are pretty unique to me. So where does this all go? I mean, what, what's your ultimate goal? Is this something that you just are doing for yourself or where's it gonna end up at? Well, you know, I've thought about that many times and it would be nice if it was in a museum or someplace that somebody could enjoy it all, you know? And uh, I, I do have some items in different museums now that are on display that, uh, that would be still part of the collection that's not here. But uh, I have a son that's very interested in it. I have a couple of grandsons that think this is really neat too. So whether they would get the same interest and, and emotion for it that I have, why I, I'm not sure. But uh, I would hope that someday that some of this could all be kept together and displayed. I hate to, I hate to sell it off because dollars can buy a lot of things, but you can't buy that emotion that goes along with that sometimes. You know what I'm saying?